Matthew, when did you decide you wanted to be a writer? I decided to write at school. I think when I wrote my essays um, at school, you know, when you had to write a, something for school, like a kind of, a, I don't know what you would call it, descriptive essay or something like that. And I remember writing essays at school and really enjoying the process and being quite experimental with what I wrote. And the teachers didn't really like that. Uh, <laughs> so I remember once writing a very descriptive story about a, a deck. There was a photograph of a deck chair and a beach. And they said, write a, I think they said write a descriptive essay. So they, they wanted me to describe the scene. But I got all metaphorical and I was, I said the deck chair wants to get through the barrier and run across the beach. And I, was like, I, got a, I turned it into like symbolism. The whole thing became symbolic for me. So I wrote this like long symbolist thing and I loved it. I kind of escaped into the writing. And then I remember my teacher was like, oh no, that's, that's not what we meant. And gave me like this really low mark. And then so I didn't actually write for a very long time after that. But I enjoyed escaping into writing. And I've always read a lot. Um, from a very young age, I've escaped into books. And I think, I think if you read a lot, you kind of want to write in some way, maybe. Or it's an easy kind of jump. And then when I was at university, no, I was... When I left school, I didn't go to university straight away. I worked for a photographic company delivering photographic accessories. And uh, I remember writing a poem. I was inspired by this tree, this really gnarled tree. And I wrote a poem in the diary that I kept for, like my work diary on the page. And uh, at that moment, I was like, oh, I might be creative. This is interesting. And I remember telling some of my friends, like almost like a secret, like, I think I might be creative. <laughs> and they were like, of course you are. And I was like, and then from then on, I think writing has just been something that's sort of gnawed at me to, you know, stories come to be told. And, and that's, I think that's where it came from. So, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's been an interesting journey. And I think that's where I first wanted to write. And then I just started, yeah. And you also have a meditation practice? That you I do, yeah, I do now, um, thank goodness. Uh, and I did a 10-day silent meditation retreat sort of much later in life. I mean, the poetry writing was early. And then I went to study screenwriting in the UK and uh, came back and started writing scripts for television in South Africa. And then many, many years later, I started meditating. And that's where I think I found a sense of calm and a sense of peace in the creative process being less reactive and more sort of active in the way I wrote. So yeah, that's been an interesting journey. So once you got past the sort of um, hiding that you were creative stage, mm. how often did you begin writing? Hmm. Again, you're asking me these great questions no one's asked before. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say I was a, a prolific writer. I'm not someone who finds writing, the writing process easy and I don't write every day. Um, I find that there's the saying that I once heard that um, something like, you know, uh, sort of real writers find it hard to write. It's like a difficult, you know, it's like a struggle. I think for not real writers, but I think to get stuff out there that matters to me, it, it, it can be a bit of a struggle, even just sitting down on the chair. I mean, there's this other great quote of, Writing is the fine art of applying the seat of your pants to the seat of a chair. <laughs> you said that. That's a good one. Yeah. And what I like about that is for me, writing is like I have to arrange my life to find the time to write. So when I wrote my book, I had to s literally put in my diary 9 to 12. I'm writing every day. And that's it. No matter what happens, people phone me and they'd say, you know, can you teach this course? If, I, if it's 9 to 12, I can't do it. So blocking out the time in my life to write is is an art form. So that's why I think it's writing is the fine art of applying the seat of your pants to the chair. The seat of a chair is like, how do you find, how do you kind of manage your life in that way? And I know a lot of writers that I know have found ways to chisel out time. So I guess my writing, um, my sort of, I suppose my writing for myself, as in writing on spec, if we've got a deadline, that's great. So I think my, and the university, when I studied it in the UK, the writing I did there, was all sort of deadline based, you know, so I wrote a whole lot of short scripts and then longer scripts and then feature films or a feature film while I was there. And that was deadline based writing. So that was quite easy for me to do. Um, and then while I was doing that, I wrote a children's book and these ideas come to me. And like I say, they, they're like these little chicks that I, I can't ignore. And, you know, they come nibbling at my feet and I'm like, write me, write me, write me. And then eventually, if I give them enough time and, and focus, then I, I will, I will write them. But it's been a, 
it's been a long, difficult process in terms of writing what I want to write. And I'm still learning actually to write, you know, the stuff that's inside me that wants to come out. Because for example, the sitcoms that I wrote, I mean, those were deadline based as well. And that was just like, I mean, I think I wrote 25 sitcoms or something in South Africa, sitcom episodes. And they were just like, that was deadline, that was in television, you know, it was like fast turnaround time. And I was writing with a, um, a writing partner. I really like um, doing writing with partners. I like sort of collaborating a lot. Um, and that was good because that had deadlines. So I think writing then was just, just kind of, because it was deadline writing, I kind of had to do it and then I did it. But yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Um, and then occasionally other stories come to me, like um, I wrote a feature film about growing up uh, in suburbia, which was and about escaping suburbia with a very loosely veiled character called Michael, not Matthew, who's not me <laughs> at all. Uh, and it's basically about how he tries to escape out of suburbia. And the more he tries, the more he gets sucked into the sort of dark underbelly of suburbia. But it's suburbia in the tip of Africa in Cape Town. So it's a, but it's just like suburbia anyway, really. So that story came to me and then I just, I kind of have to write it. And then I have to go on like some sort of a retreat. And I went away uh, and found a quiet place and then just wrote that. I find getting the first draft out is the, that's what takes the time. Yeah. Well, oh, excuse me, what is the underbelly of suburbia? I'd love to hear about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so in this story, the, under, the underbelly of suburbia is based on, on kind of my, my life in, in Tableview, where I grew up, which is a small suburban town, area in Cape Town. Uh, it's a biker gang. So a uh, sort of like a biker gang that deals with um, drugs and uh, organizes swingers parties and like all very, but it's all very kind of low brow. It's funny, really. You know, the guy who's the biker gang leader is, you know, he's just a kind of a big, cuddly bear of a man. But he <laughs> he doesn't want anyone to get out of his grasp, you know. And he has a bit of a history with this guy's father, and so yeah, and so he gets he 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 owes the guy money eventually, sort of gambling debt, I guess. And then he just gets more and more sucked in, and he just can't get away. And his dad is an ATM repairman which existed in those days. And he has access to all the ATMs and this guy wants access. And so the more Michael tries to get away, the more this guy tries to manipulate him until he tries to get him to betray his dad and give him access to all that. So it's kind of like money and, you know, dodgy dealings in the underbelly of suburbia, including you know, swingers parties and strange stuff that Michael gets distracted from. Yeah. yeah. Do you think one of the things with suburbia is the need to conform? And anybody who violates that like norm is then suspect, even though everybody mm -hmm. kind of wants to already violate that, but they're too afraid. Absolutely. I think so. So my experience of suburbia was when, when I was really young, um, we moved to an area that was quite pristine, almost like a wilderness area. Um, and it was beautiful. And we didn't even have tart roads. There were very few houses around. So there was lots of empty lots with, you know, just, I don't know, shrubs and bush growing in it. Um, but then Table View, which is the small area, became the fastest growing suburb in the Southern Hemisphere and just expanded. So things really happened really quickly around me. Tarred roads, pavements, malls, which were never there before. And so literally I felt suburbia grow up around me when I was younger. And it was really like, um, I, I, I definitely have an aversion to suburbia because I was in this pristine, beautiful wilderness. The next thing I know, I'm in a concrete jungle and it's like there was a sort of formal formative time of my life. And so I think suburbia does try and fit you into a certain thing. This suburb is still growing. And what they do is they, they just kind of clear out some land, they build roads, and then they put up a mall before the houses come. It's bizarre. They put up like a mall and they put up like a, a gas station and then the houses come. And it's like, they're really trying to get you to fit in a certain way. You know, it's just the way I think it's just, it's easier to manage as a space. And I guess if you don't fit in there, yeah, I certainly riled against suburbia I am um, in a big way. Suburbia does try and make you conform, I think. It does, it does. Mm. And I think if you, that, uh, what is, there's a quote from a song, conform or be cast out. Oh. And so uh, that it's, sometimes it's fun to be the outcast though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, <laughs> that may be me. <laughs> We're good. Yeah, yeah. We have something in common. <laughs> um, do you think with meditation, because mm. you, you mentioned earlier that you like to have a certain, you know, your life organized around you and you have these very organized times, mm. um, that meditation also helps organize mm -hmm. the thoughts? Definitely. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it does. I'm actually, uh, 
It does, yeah, it definitely does okay. organize the thoughts, I think. And it, yeah, I don't know where to take that further. Yeah, that's fine. No, we could just leave it at that. We don't, yeah. I just I just thought that was interesting because you mentioned how you like this organization. Mm. And and I, and I if there's maybe too much chaos, then it's not. I think a lot of the chaos is in my own mind, if you know what I mean. So sure. it's interesting. There can be a lot of um, demands of our time in terms of work, other people, but also of my mind. You know, I could wake up in the morning and have a an open day where I could write but my mind is just I'm having the internal battle you know with myself and my thoughts and my you know questions are you worthy enough are you good enough um, you know is this is the story good enough all these kind of things of are you enough you know and meditation for me helps me to just calm the moment down slow the mind down and just be and then creating from that space is a very interesting and liberating space because I'm not feeling judged by myself or by anyone. Right, and sometimes there's just like these little things that I remember one time someone said to me, why are you giving that free rent in your head? Mm. And I was like, oh, wow, she's That's right. Nice. Yeah, I am. Okay, That's let nice. me stop. <laughs> That's a really nice way of putting it. What type of writer did you want to be? I know you said you attended screenwriting classes yeah. in the UK. Wow. What were your goals? You've got such great questions. Um, I actually wanted to be a film director and not a writer. Um, so when I was in grade seven, um, um, the, the headmaster of my school said, it was like career day, and they were like, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a film director. Like I knew from that age, I wanted to be a film director. I love film so much. I used to escape in it all the time. And his response was not ideal. It was like, no, you can't do that in this country, South Africa. You can't be that. Tell me what else you want to be. So I like left his office devastated and I was like, oh, alrighty. And I looked around and I saw a lot of like na nature spaces, wilderness spaces, and I love escaping into nature. So I went back and I said, okay, I'll be a game ranger. And he said, much better, do geography, and then ticked me off the list and that was it. I think he just wanted me to put me in a stream <laughs> and there was no stream for film director. So they were like, okay, game ranger, that's a good, good choice. So I, uh, so I knew from a very young age that I want to be a film director and I used to always play with video cameras and VHS tapes, recording from one to another and doing editing. And so I was always in that space of, um, yeah, I guess of being a film director. And I had stories come to me even at that age, but I was always thinking of them in terms of film. I didn't even really realize that screenwriting was something that happened. And then when I went to university, I, um, I studied English because I was kind of close to, to writing or, or film. They, were, they did film stuff in English and environmental and geographical science, which was the game ranger thing. So even young, even at that age, I was still like hedging my bets, you know, game ranger or filmmaker. And so I've, yeah, from a very, very young age, I've always wanted to make films of some kind. And I, I think it depended on what films I was watching as to what kind of films I would want to make. So when I was younger, I wanted to make like, you know, action and adventure stories. Um, and then as I got older, I was more interested in the experimental films. So then I wanted to make experimental type films. And now I'm just interested in, I suppose, life and drama and the, the real stuff, you know, with subtleties of emotion and complexities of life. And those are the stories that, are, that are now interest, I'm now interested in. So I never really had an aim to be a particular kind of writer, but I guess a serious writer is what I've kind of always wanted to be. Yeah, don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. It does. How did you feel uh, American showed cinema versus Wow. Maybe the South African mindset. I know that different yeah. places have different mindsets. Mm -hmm. Different things happen historically. Yeah. And we see so like it's ironic that my um, headmaster may have been right in some ways. Uh, principal. And he calls you one of them principal? Yeah, headmaster. Oh, yeah. right, right, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, they may, he may have been right in some ways because uh, the South African film industry, um, even though it's growing and there's been some really good films coming out of South Africa and there's been, you know, we did Totsi, which won um, Best Foreign Film a couple of years ago. Gavin Hood moved out here and there's a lot of South African directors who when they sort of make it, they move to LA. Um, our film industry is definitely growing, but we have a problem with distribution. So the majority of our population, this is the historical factors of, of filmmaking in South Africa, the majority of our population live in very, very poor surroundings. So South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world. And so um, people who live in, I guess you could call them, we call them townships, like squatter camps, I guess, um, haven't got money to spend on entertainment in the way that going to a cinema would be, or even buying a Netflix account or anything like that. 
You'll find your movies other ways. There'll be pirated DVD things. You'll find other ways of getting your entertainment, and there is also good television entertainment. So in South Africa, the problem is distribution. So we, we don't have the, um, the finances readily available to make the kind of movies and as many movies as we'd like to make. So there is there are some movies that get made, and as I say, it's growing every year, which is great when technology becomes easier to afford. We're making more and more movies, but we just don't have that. Like when I'm here in America, I just see the AMC cinemas. I'm like, wow, these are what? You go AMC diner and you're sitting and your food's coming to you. You've got seats <laughs> that recline. I'm like, we have that in South Africa. They're called prestige cinemas and only really rich people can afford them. Whereas here, it seems like a lot of people, well, not everyone, but a lot of people can afford to go to the cinema. And so you can afford to have a very healthy industry. Whereas in South Africa, it's tiny. And so we, you know, and it's expensive making a movie. So yeah, this is what, this is what happens is um, the film industry culture in South Africa. Although I, what I like about it is it's very gung-ho. Anyone with a camera can make a film. You know, you just go off there and you make a film. There's a huge independent spirit to making films in South Africa, which I like. But we just don't have the studio. We don't have studios. There's, the studios don't exist in South Africa. We have production companies that make movies that then get distribution deals, but there's no studio system. So even if you have a script doing the rounds, it'll do a round to like three or four people and then it's done. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's just those three people. There's like yeah. a few people and like you know them and they come around to your house and you, you, know, you don't want to mention um, I've got a great script because they're just your friends. So yeah, it's kind of a smallish cottage industry, yeah. What's the fastest way to learn screenwriting? The fastest way of learning screenwriting is very easy read scripts. It's that simple. So people who um, write novels very often just sit down in their computer and they start writing. But chances are they've read lots of novels in their lives, almost certainly. So there's this famous saying, you know, if you want to learn how to write, you just read, 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 and write, write, write. So script writing is exactly the same. Read lots of scripts. What I find really strange is um, participants at my workshops and people who come to my talks and stuff, I'm like, how many of you have read a feature film script? And like out of the 40 people, maybe it's a South African thing, but not many people have read a feature film script, but they want to write movies because they've watched lots of movies. So they think because they're a movie fan and they like to watch movies that they can write scripts. And I'm like, but you've never seen this document of a script properly. You may have read, you know, uh, transcriptions of scripts, but you've never looked at the formatting and the layout and the style and the structure and all this kind of thing. So I would say just read as many scripts as you can, and they're all available online. You know, there are websites where you can get them. And just, because I mean, I think that's how we learn, it's just from reading. And I mean, if you read many, many feature film scripts, then you'll end up writing feature film. That's the, for me, that's the fast track to writing good scripts, is reading lots of scripts. And they're there, it's available. You can read the screenwriting books on how to write scripts, but really, if you just read the scripts, lots of them, and keep up to date with what's happening and the trends of the writing styles and how things are changing through the years. So, you know, don't just read Casablanca and Chinatown, because there are certain formatting at a certain time. Read current scripts as well. If you're interested in TV series, read TV series scripts, because they're also written in a different style. And then you start to see the writer's voice, and then perhaps from that you can start writing your own voice. So I would say the fast track is just read loads of scripts. Then, of course, write loads of scripts. So uh, my first script that I ever wrote does not exist anymore anywhere in this world, I hope. There's no digital copy of it. It was terrible. Um, it probably had a lot of formatting errors. It was, it was just, you know, it wasn't terrible. It was just misguided youth, enthusiasm of youth. Um, so you've got to write quite a lot to get that stuff out of your system, I think. Or, you know, you get the genius writer who may write a first script and it's like fantastic. But I'd say write a few times and see how it works. Get feedback as well from people who are not your mother or your best friend. And, and then rewrite that script and then you'll start to get somewhere. Yeah, I'd, I suppose that's the fast track to, to writing. It goes without saying that one needs to watch lots of movies or television and be you know, steeped in that world. Um, yeah. And then to make it really good, um, <laughs> I was going to say read the book, The Three Worlds of Screenwriting, but what and I want to say- And that's your book? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But what I want to say is tap into what only you can bring into the script. So it's all very well reading loads of scripts and writing loads of scripts if you're just going to write another um, crime thriller or you know so, something that someone else can do better. What can you write? What's the only the story that only you can write? The stories that only you can write? Or the themes that only you can write? If you can tap into that, then you are really putting something in there that is um, authentic, and it'll people will recognize it when they read it immediately. 
so I, I did a lot of script reading in the past and uh, for competitions and I, I've read too many scripts I, for, yeah, for my own sanity. But when you're reading them, you, you suddenly something just leaps off the page and that's an authenticity. It's a moment of, of realness, a real character moment, a real moment of subtlety, a real location, a real something that just leaps off the page. If you can put that in your scripts, then I really believe that you'll have an advantage over, over other scripts. So yeah, read lots of scripts and write the kind of scripts only you can write. And what was the first script that you read? Oh, that's a, another great question. Hmm. And do you remember the year? It was probably quite late. I was, oh, while I've read plays, so you, the first things I read were plays, stage plays, before I read scripts. Um, things like Waiting for Godot and these like plays that are, you know, the standard plays you read if you're doing an English degree or something like that. In South Africa, we read some plays. Um, and the first script I read was probably Cinema Paradiso. I don't know if you know that. It's a, it's a movie by an Italian filmmaker, Giuseppe Tornatore, and he won the, um, he did win the, um, many, many years ago, he wrote this beautiful movie, Cinema Paradiso, and, and shot it, and it's great. And I love that movie. And I think that was the first script I ever bought and the first script I ever read. But just the caveat goes, it was one of those transcripted scripts that you can buy. So it's like a book version of a script. And it's, you know, it's got all the dialogue and stuff in there and some of the action, but it wasn't formatted in a correct script format. I think the first one I probably read was Chinatown in proper script formatting. But I remember buying the book of Cinema Paradiso and reading it and being able to picture all the scenes in my head. And that's a, that's a real skill that people kind of have to develop. You know, you've got to buy the, you've got to read these scripts to picture it in your head, to feel what it feels like so that when you write it, you can make someone picture those scenes in their head. It's a, it's a different thing. I, I often say um, that for me, when people think they can write scripts without reading scripts, it's like going to a classical concert and listening to a piece of classical music and thinking, oh, I love this music. I'm going to go home and write some music now. And just writing music randomly with dots and squiggles because you know there's dots and squiggles and lines and just kind of writing some sort of a document that you think looks like sheet music and then handing it over to someone and expecting them to play, they're not going to understand. And it's like an architect going, you know, if you see a beautiful building and you think, oh, this building's really beautiful. I love this building and I like buildings and I understand buildings and I, I like Art Deco style. I'm going to go home and design a building and you just kind of design the building without having looked at blueprints or read sheet music. That's why you've got to read scripts. A movie is not a script. It's a, it's a different thing. They serve different kind of functions almost. So, yeah. So, so you can't be Frank Geary unless you... <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, <laughs> right, you, yeah, yeah. right, right. And the same thing, you can't be William Goldman. If yeah, William just... Goldman just did, you know, did whatever he wanted really. And although I do think that, um, yeah, it's all about being able to evoke an emotion in the reader. So maybe they could, they could do that. They already had a way of doing it somehow in their writing, you know, so that's, yeah, I don't know. It's a... Well, I think people think of the notion of a genius or a savant or something and they think well maybe I can duplicate mm -hmm. the same without having to take all the steps yeah. in between yeah. and and I think you know we hear these stories of, mm. of people just from from you know age 5 yes. being able to do something amazing exactly. and exactly. maybe it is inside of us but it needs a little coaching or Yeah. I, I think screenwriting though is a bit of a craft. So you don't actually hear of savant screenwriters. Like I've never heard of a five-year-old writing a great script or even a 17-year-old writing a great script. Sometimes you can get, you know, the woman who wrote Juno, um, I forget, she was quite- Diablo young. Cody? Yeah, she was relatively young when she wrote that. But we don't know the back, I don't really know actually what happened there. I know some of the story, but it, we just, it, because it's a craft, it, it's like, um, like pottery or something. You know, you, you don't just, if you're a genius potter, you still have to practice to get the pot to be correct. And I really believe with screenwriting, it is a bit of a craft. And so uh, we don't get these savants. We just don't. We don't get the great 17 year old going to fetch the best screenwriting award. Not yet, although it might change because the youngsters nowadays and the access they have to filmmaking ability is very exciting and amazing. I mean, they've got thing phones, you know, stuff on the apps. They can just make music videos just like that. So maybe it'll change. Maybe in the future, the ability to make what's in your head won't have this craft in between step and maybe we'll have youngsters making the best films ever. Who knows? It would be nice. <laughs> What's the best screenwriting book you've read? I have to remember what this is called. You might have to look it up. Oh, and I'm terrible with names. So there is this, there's two actually. So I, 
my first thought when you said, what's the best screenwriting book I've ever read was um, Chris Vogler's book. That was my first thought. Because that was the first book I ever read on screenwriting. It was given to me and it was like, oh, wow. It's, you know, it was really interesting and the idea of archetypes and writing to you know, the mythic stories inside us was really interesting. Um, and I think it's seminal, so you know, kind of have to read it. Um, and then my second thought was, I kind of like save the cat popped up there in a way, but it was also like, it's a structure thing. And uh, I am suspicious of structure and screenwriting, even though we need structure overly structured stories for me where the beats of the story top the character's motivations and the characters themselves can result sometimes in stories that just sit a little bit uncomfortable with me and are very predictable and, and you know, we, we just watch them and we're not as moved by them as when you're trying to do something and maybe a little bit different. So I, I didn't go for that one. Then my mind went to, um, Actually, my mom wrote another book called uh, David Mame, uh, Heresy and Common Sense for Actors. It's quite an interesting book. David Mame has got a very interesting take on writing, uh, very different to anyone else. So anything that David Mame writes on writing is very interesting. And then the one that just kind of sticks with me is Alexander McKendrick on filmmaking, which is a, as far as I understand, he's a professor who taught at UCLA for a while, and he was Quite a character, quite interesting. He wrote this book. It's got two direct, two sections, one on directing and one on writing. And in the section on writing, he's just got a really honest way of, of writing about the writing process. And he's got some really great quotes there, you know, like, um, I can't even remember, but like, there are three kinds of student film, uh, long, too long, and very much too long. <laughs> you know, they, he's kind of like, he, he's got a bit of a sense of humor in, in what he's writing about, so I really like that, yeah. So that one, um, that section on writing was, was quite seminal in a way for me, even though I can't tell you exactly the sort of hints and tips that he used. It was just, he kind of, he kind of was talking about the art of writing in a way that wasn't um, too prescriptive, and I really liked that, yeah. So that was really, I can recommend that. At what point did a teaching opportunity open up for you? When I studied my master's in screenwriting in the UK, um, I had to decide whether I'm going to stay in the UK or come back to South Africa. And I decided to come back to South Africa because there were, there were more opportunities. The UK film industry is very regulated in a way. You have to almost do apprentice positions to work your way up the ladder. And I came back to South Africa, and as soon as I came back to South Africa, my sort of mentor at the university there, a woman called Leslie Marks, she said, don't you want to come talk to our students about screenwriting? Almost immediately. So I'd just come back and my, I'll never forget my first sort of teaching opportunity around screenwriting was to a class of um, yes, second or third year English students who were also interested in writing and screenwriting. And then I gave a talk on what I knew about screenwriting at that time, which was hardly anything. I was so nervous. I had to write on the whiteboard. And I, I kind of had this thing about there's no step ladder to success in screenwriting. There's, you know, you have to kind of make it up as you go along in terms of you have to hustle, do a lot of hustling. And that was the first time. And then from then on, um, I just guess the lecture went down really well. And so they started employing me part time to um, teach. And then eventually it turned into full time. And I've been teaching, I've basically been teaching for the last 20 years very soon. That was 2000. So it's like 19 years I've been teaching. And that's been on and off at various institutions and sometimes full time. And it's been a long career. So it's interesting. My mom is a teacher. And my dad was a, he worked in a photography store and was very interested in filmmaking and used to bring film cameras home in the early days and he bought video cameras home. And, and so I think I'm the combination of the two, the filmmaker and the teacher. So I don't know, it's just, I love teaching. I love inspiring people to tell the stories that they really want to tell. That's my, my true passion. So yeah, that's when I first started teaching. And I've, ever since I've, I've always been doing it. Yeah. So when you first were asked to teach this class, it didn't feel like deer in the headlights? Oh, no, it felt terrifying. Felt, oh, it did? Oh, okay. Oh, I was so scared. Um, and interestingly enough, I was speaking to um, one of my fellow authors recently who, who said when they teach, they still feel nervous. And I think it's quite a good thing. I still feel a little nervous. I mean, I gave a talk recently, and it was it uh, turned out being much bigger than I thought it would. It was like a studio space, and I had a little microphone thing, and there were like loads of people. Oh, and no. I was like, okay. And I was a little bit nervous. But I know when I talk about what I'm really passionate about, it just flows, which is great. So um, the nerves subside, but I think being slightly nervous, because um, nervousness, sort of fear and excitement are very similar. And um, there's a saying about um, fear is just excitement without the breath. 
if you breathe through it, then you can access your excitement and then you can get excited about things. But there's definitely a fear about, um, I think it's good for a teacher to be a little bit nervous before they go on stage or before they go on, you know, in front of the class. Because I think if you're bored about what you're doing and you're like, oh, well, I'll just go exactly. and do, I'll do the same thing again. I know it works. It just doesn't have an edge to it. I think there needs to be a little bit of uh, deer in the headlights slightly. When you start losing that, I think maybe your passion has gone. I don't know. You know, that is a great point because I've had different people come at me before an interview because I let them know that I am nervous. Yeah. And one of whom was an A-list actor who asked me, why are you nervous? Oh. And I said, because this matters to me. Yeah. And he was like, oh, wow. And another person who mm. was a journalist and said, you shouldn't be nervous. You should do this all the time. Uh, and I said, I am. And she well, said, Well, you told why? me you were nervous before this interview. And I was <laughs> right? like, fantastic. Because I we like care. Yeah. yeah, because you care. It's, you know, it's important to you. So yeah, I think it's, it's good to be a, bit, a little bit of nervous before you go in any public forum. It's good. I think that's part of the Western culture, though, is to kind of be like, oh, I got this. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah, and I, I think totally. that's false. Yeah. I and think I think so. that's something that... There's a lot of falsity in... in in our lives, you know, often we, we have to pretend to be people we're not. And, you know, there's that imposter syndrome that pops up and then you're like, am I really this person? Am I really good enough? Am I really a writer? Am I, you know, am I a creative person? And these questions are not really supposed to be spoken about, but people are speaking about them more and more, which I think is really healing for society. I hope so. So, yeah. How has teaching made you a better writer? Being conscious of what I'm doing that, is, that has been really interesting because before I was a teacher um, and I'd learned some of the writing techniques and I was doing writing, when I had to express that to a student or a learner or something and I had to say, so uh, this is what I do or this is how it's done, suddenly I had to consciously stop and think about, wait a minute, what do I do? How do I do this thing that I do? And that has made me really conscious, sort of a conscious writer. And that process has been led me to some really interesting places, um, which I do talk about in the book. But it's also just generally being more conscious about what I'm doing on all levels. Because when you have to express that to a student, um, yeah, you have to kind of think through what you're doing. And that's been really great. Um, and I think it's also, sometimes I get people giving guest lectures and they're, they're really great writers but they can't explain what they're doing. They just go, I don't know, I just do it. Often, you know, <laughs> I also, when I've run film schools and I've, I've taught in film schools, and I, especially cinematographers, you know, they don't really know what they're doing. They just, they just do it. They're geniuses at it. But you get a good cinematographer to come and run a cinematography class, they don't know, you just push this button here, you do this thing. It's, it's, it's difficult for some people to translate what they do into um, easily understandable bits of knowledge you can pass on to students. So that was, for me, where I learned about myself because I had to express what I'm doing. That was, yeah, that was really good. So I think that's made me a, a better writer in that I, um, I'm more conscious of what I'm doing when I'm doing it, especially around dialogue writing, which was difficult for me in the beginning, being more conscious about writing dialogue, being conscious about writing subtext. You say these things to your students enough, eventually you start doing it yourself. However, there's a flip side to this, which is that a lot of people, and I've spoken to some really famous script gurus who want to write and are terrified because now you're the guru and you have to write. So there's another flip side to this, which is I've got this story that's been pecking at my feet, wanting to be told, and I have to write this now. And I've written this book that's done really well, and now it's like, okay, I've got to write a script now. And there's a bit of nerves around that because you're like, from the position of now, like the, you know, the person who should know how to do it, now you've got to do it. It's interesting. It's a lot of pressure. Can you do a Donald Trumbo? Can you like write under another name or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be funny. <laughs> because then you would feel maybe in some sense less pressure because yeah. people will be just judging it based on the work, not on, well, oh wait, but he also wrote this book yeah. as a teacher. I think there's a, and the style was moving around. I, I think there's a, um, the now that my book's written, my name is, you know, you're known as the guy who wrote this book, so it opens doors as well. So you can, so you kind of have to write under that name because that's the name that opens the doors. And I'm actually fine with it. I'll, I'll get over myself and I'll, I'll write it. When you talk about conscious, being conscious of things, um, it has me thinking about the power of intention. Yes. How does that yes. also factor into wow. writing? Interesting. I believe intention is very important um, when we're writing. Um, and okay, 
I'm a bit conservative in some ways. I'm not at all conservative, but the only way that I'm conservative is, and maybe it's not conservative, is that I do believe that the messages we put out there as filmmakers um, affect the world. I only know this because when I was younger and I watched the screen, I remember consciously watching the screen thinking, okay, if that's allowed on the screen, that's allowed in life. Like I remember feeling this thing of like, those people in order to do what they do on the screen, or in order for that stuff to be, they must have passed some sort of a process or, and now it's, now it's allowed and now that's the way we should be or that's the way we should behave or that kind of behavior is okay. So I do believe that as, as film creators, and I know this is a sort of contentious issue in some ways, some people are like, just put anything up on the screen. I'm like, I think we need to be careful of what world we want to create. But I'm the kind of person who doesn't litter because he wants to create a better world. Um, so therefore, I don't want to litter with the stories that I'm creating either. So I want to have an intention. And my intention with my book is to inspire people to tell stories that matter to make the world a better place. Like really, that is what I would love to do. And when I say make the world a better place, I mean more equal, more um, just fruitful, more considerate, um, less harm, less uh, fighting, less war, all those kind of things. And I think that the stories we put out there do matter. And so therefore the intentionality behind what we write and why we write is important for the world in general. And so I think we have to be careful what we create in a way. Um, and we have to also be careful how it affects us. So why do I want to write? Do I want to write for a claim? Do I want to write because I want to impress my father? You know, there are these questions about, mm. and, and am I going to be a happy person? Even if I get an Academy Award and I you know, do really well, am I going to be a happy person? So, so that intentionality, both in what I'm creating and why I'm creating it, I think is really important to kind of make the world a better place in some way. So I think it's, yeah, it's vitally important. So part of the intentionality and the importance, I think, of, of having an intention when you're writing comes from a lesson that I learned early on in my career where I wanted to write above all else. All I wanted to do was, was write. I wanted to you know, be paid to write and to make a movie. And so I wrote a slasher, slasher horror film, because I knew that it was cheap to make. I knew that it would get funding. And it was the kind of thing that, I, you know, that one could make. I don't watch slasher horror movies myself, but I thought, okay, this will be fun. And I wrote a story um, about a whole lot of students on their way to a rave in the desert, sort of like um, like the burn, Burning Man, and they take a wrong turn and they get lost and uh, they get slowly but surely hacked to death by an apartheid experiment gone wrong and these two genetically modified dogs. Uh, and it was a kind of a slasher horror thing and it was pretty dark and it, it, it was like I went to places that were quite gruesome. Um, and. It did get some funding. It got funding from one of our national funders. Um, a production company was interested in doing it. They um, raised some funds. I was talking to eventually some people in LA who were, who were mad. Uh, they were crazy. They were like, can he rip the wings off the plane? And I'm like, no, he can't rip the wings off the plane. He's not that kind of a monster. Anyway, but it was, it was my intention was to make a film at any costs. And I remember when we were doing some location scouting uh, for the film, uh, we went to this farm, beautiful farm in the desert, and there were these uh, trees in the distance, and they were beautiful trees, and I said, oh, that looks just like what the landing script could be for the plan. Could you take the trees down? And the farmer was like, sure, I'll take the trees down, no problem. You know, he just wanted the job, wanted us to shoot on his land. And then, so I was going to go and destroy trees in nature, which is not really what I am about, make a movie that scared people, made them not want to go out into nature because the story was basically about these kids going off to explore and go out the world and they slowly but surely get killed by this you know horrible monster so that for me the effect would have been that people would have been scared to leave their homes you know they were just that fear that horror movies can sometimes you know would have been even more and the, the message behind the film would have been like don't go out into nature because people will kill you and also uh, i'll destroy some trees in reality on the way for making this film but I still wanted them. I didn't even, at that point, I didn't have that realization. But the story ran into some difficulties. Two production companies split up. The other production company wanted to keep the film, I think. And eventually I used to dread getting emails about this and it turned into a nightmare. One of those absolute nightmares, I was just like, oh. And then I realized, do you really want to make this film, Matthew? Can you imagine, because I was going to direct it, can you imagine sitting there in the scene with this girl with like wrapped up in um, razor wire and you saying like more blood we need more blood like i just it's not i'm not that person i'm really not that person so what i learned from that was that my intention 
was to make a film at any cost and become a film director at any cost. And actually, if that had happened, I'm not sure I would have been in a very happy place or would have created a message that improved the world in any way necessarily. It might have, I might have done ex the exact opposite of what I started out trying to do. So that's why intentionality is really important to me. And I think it's important as a writer to think further along the line of what effect will this have on me and the world when I'm writing it. Um, however, you also can't censor yourself. So that stuff needed to come out, it came out. I just worked in the film school for two years. I think I was very angry at students. And so therefore I wrote the slash of harmony where students get hacked to death. So maybe that helped me therapeutically in some ways. So yeah, you gotta, I don't wanna like say limit yourself. I just wanna say check your intentions. Sure. And was there part of it too where you wanted to write to the market? Yes, definitely. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. No, for sure. I wanted to write to the market. And what, what I found really interesting is in my original intention in writing the slasher movie, I, I, my original intention was I'm going to write a movie where the main character, I was trying to find out what is the main character's strength that makes him kill the monster. I wanted it to be empathy. I wanted the main character to empathize with the monster in such a way that he could actually understand where the monster was coming from and somehow solve the problem of this story. However, the genre itself does not allow that to happen. <laughs> I realized that the hero in a slasher horror movie cannot empathize with the monster. It just, it just didn't work in the end. The structure itself of, of a slasher horror movie was, well, the hero has to kill the monster. That's just, you know, at some point he has to physically overcome the, the monster with violence, which is the way that a lot of, you know, stories work. And so I found that my original intention of actually pushing empathy as a character trait didn't work at all. Was there a period in your life where you really wanted to understand story? So you, even more so, you hunkered down and devoured everything from watching films, screenplays? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a funny story about that, I think, in a way, is that I, when I was really young, I read The Trial by Kafka, and I think I was too young for it. I was, I think it was, I don't know, how 15 or something like that. And I remember it really left an impression on me because there was all these dreamlike images and. But I didn't understand it. And I think that evoked in me this need to understand story because I was just like, I don't understand what's going on in the story. It's freaky, I like it, but I don't know what it is. And I think that kind of solving the puzzle of Kafka's The Trial <laughs> led me on this journey of writing and, and understanding writing, I think, for sure. Yeah, and that was, yeah, that was seminal. What does it mean to tap into a well when it comes to story? So, yeah, in, this, in my book, The Three Wells of Screenwriting, I use the metaphor of, of a well, because for me, wells are, you know, I mean, the desert they needed, obviously, to kind of provide life, blood of, you know, of water, not blood, but like water to survive. You can't really survive in a desert without them. And I don't think we can survive without stories. And so for me, tapping into a well is taking that metaphor and expanding it a bit and, and digging into either other movies you've seen um, or your imagination or your memory and literally drawing up water, which are stories, to kind of feed the, the, the tribe. And I always just like the idea of a well because wells are mysterious. You know, they go down into some sort of a groundwater and the groundwater seeps everywhere and connects everything else. So I think that there's something like the collective unconsciousness that Jung talks about is in a well. You know, you kind of, you never know what you're gonna find down there. It's going to be surprising to you, hopefully, but it can also be really rich and life-giving. So for me, that's what I mean by tapping into a well. I think I got the idea from overhearing a, um, a composer talk about how when he composed music, um, sort of classical composer, that sometimes it felt like he was just tapping into an underground river and the music was this river just flowing. And if he could tap into it, he could just listen to the music. And for me, if a story comes to you like that, that's, a, that's amazing. So, so yeah, it's esoteric, but it, t for me, it talks about uh, the creative process in a way that's really real for me, yeah. I like that. You think a lot of writers are tapping into this, they could, it could be a well or, mm -hmm. or even air up mm -hmm. above. Mm -hmm. You think that's something that when they get into like this right mindset and they're in their favorite writing environment? Yeah, definitely. I think um, it's beautiful when it happens. It's sometimes difficult to get there. And the point of my book is to help people get there. But often we can feel stuck and we're not in that space of flow. And flow is also like this... Flow reminds me of like a river where a well can draw from, in a way. Yeah, it can be really difficult to get to that space, but when you're in that space as a writer, you kind of recognize it, I think. When the characters start 
almost behaving and talking by themselves, and it's like this weird world that you've imagined, but it's alive. Then we're then we're in the flow of writing, and that for me does feel a bit like drawing from a well. So I think that's yeah that flow, the underground river that we sort of tap into. It can also be a lightning bolt from above. There's been many you know angels inspiring us, the muses inspiring us. There's been a lot of stories as to where ideas come from. But I think uh, you know it when you feel it when you're writing. It's great, and it's like and, and for me, time stops, things slow down. I don't eat, I don't worry about anything. I just write. When I mean, you read about some people who've written famous works or famous songs, they they don't know where it comes from. It just the song comes, the story comes. That's that's an amazing space if you can get there. It's interesting that you say that some days it's very difficult to get there because even with runners or even mm-hmm. people who walk. There is sort of like a walker's high or runner's high, but some days it doesn't happen. It's Absolutely. just either you're off or the yep. world is off, like yep. some tragic stories out there, and you can feel it around you, and it's wow. just like, I can't get to that place today. Interesting. Can you not get to that place even if you run for, 20, for a while? Does it eventually just come, or does it sometimes never come on the whole run? For me, sometimes it just doesn't come. That's amazing. I don't know, and, and I don't know if it's just it's more me or it's the environment or it's too like you know if I, it's more traffic yeah. it, let's say you're trying to yeah, and yeah, so yeah, you're yeah. stopping and okay. starting and you can't yeah, really yeah. be around that so. that's interesting because i think from a writer's point of view sometimes you can write and the whole session is frustrating and you're like i didn't get to that place i'm a failure this is terrible but you just have to go again and that's that can be very difficult i think like really really difficult yeah and you have right. to just push through and just get out of vomit draft as I call it, vomit draft. Just you know, just you vomit it out, and even if it's terrible, somewhere along the line, once you've done that and you go and rewrite, you you may hit that space again. But it can be very limiting for people. I think it can be frustrating. Writing can be frustrating, even as you know, it's surprising. Jogging can be frustrating. I've just started surfing, which has never really been frustrating. It can be frustrating, but it's always pleasurable when I leave the water. But it can be very frustrating. But it really, what what just because you're waiting for a wave. And if it doesn't come or you're not catching it at the right time? Um, no, more like if the conditions are terrible and the waves are everywhere and they're hitting you and it's like crazy and it's chaos and you just like, and you can't catch the wave sometime and you paddle, paddle, paddle and like the wave just goes past you and you're like, ah. I've literally shouted. Like I've actually paddled on a surfboard and I'm paddling and then I, I, I miss the wave and it turns into pounding the wave. So I think it, it's what you bring to it as well. I think, you know, this is why, I mean, surfing is, taught me about um, what I bring to the surf. If I'm in a frustrated mode, it's a way of releasing it. And I think maybe in writing, it's the same. You were saying about you know, jogging, it can just be you maybe, what you bring to the jog before. And that's also why conscious writing and meditation is kind of important, because you're, kind of, you're aware of that. It's not writing that's the problem. It's maybe, and it's not me that's the problem, but it's just everything that I'm bringing to it. And so there's a bit of a freedom in that. Yeah. Do you feel closer to, I'll just call it, the source, the universe, a higher power, or whatever, when you write? Sure. That's a very interesting question. Um, not always. Um, I think I can write and not be in touch with my higher power or source and actually be very far from it, but think that I'm doing the kind of writing that I should be doing. And this is where I think I can get lost. So with the slasher horror story, I'm not sure that was in line with what my higher power or the source wanted me to write, because my intention was in the wrong place. So for me, being in conscious contact with my higher power is a very difficult daily thing that I have to keep doing. And to translate that into writing, I think, merely the fact that I'm writing doesn't mean that I'm in touch with my eye power. Even it might feel creative, it might feel fun, but it's not always. Sometimes I may be, I don't know, doing it for the wrong reasons in a way. I don't know if this answers the question, but sometimes when I'm writing, it does feel very like aligned and everything just kind of flows and you're in the flow and everything's perfect. And that does feel a little bit higher power Yeah, it does feel a bit like a divine intervention, that kind of thing, you know, um, Zeus lightning bolt from above, you know, it can feel, um, yeah, I need to do more writing. That's what I've, that's what is making me realize. Because I think when, when I am writing in tune with my higher power or whatever, it's, it can be really powerful. Yeah. I know we've talked about intention a couple times during our interview today. What if somebody knows their intention is not exactly in line with them, but they know they're going to write anyway. So they're yeah. aware. Yeah. 
I'm writing this for the market. Yep. I'm writing a revenge story, yep. whatever it is. Yeah. And I know that. And I'm going to own yeah. that. And then that's here it is. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. I couldn't be in that space. Uh, the revenge stories are so interesting to me because revenge stories are like, I mean, I don't want to go on a whole tangent, but I might. No, no, stop me. I won't. I better not. I'll get into trouble. Revenge stories for me are, uh, you know, when I was 15 or 16 or, you know, and I was a long haired goth and I was depressed, revenge stories were all I thought of. <laughs> <laughs> all the time and so I find revenge stories are almost like juvenile and they just they just kind of spurt out and they're very easy to access um, so yeah I, I think if you want to write that then I guess it's fine I'm just not really interested in writing that myself and I'm not really that interested in watching it because it's never it's not going to teach me anything new it's going to teach me what I knew when I was 15 you know it's not there's nothing there's no insight into the world for necessarily for me in a revenge story I think um, however yeah, sometimes you just have to write for the market if you want to earn money and, you know, someone's got to... But I think it can lead you into difficult spaces, you know, it can lead you into places that are maybe not the best. And um, But the very nature and structure of movies actually is, you know, an individual overcoming obstacles, fighting things, getting what they want, and very often, more often than not, especially now in the age of Avengers and movies, killing the bad guy with brute force and then winning. You know, that's the, you know... It's the American way. It really is in a way. It's like, you know, might makes right. I'm stronger than you. I'm, I can shoot guns faster than you. I can punch faster than you. I'm hardy, therefore I'm the goody. And getting out of that paradigm is a really difficult thing. And I think that that paradigm has got us into a lot of trouble as a society. But finding stories that have different solutions to that problem is exciting for me. And that's where the real cool stuff happens. So like even in Doctor Strange, at the end of Doctor Strange, the Avengers movie, he negotiates with the monster. He actually says, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep coming back in time. And I'm going to keep being here unless you leave me alone. And the monster then leaves. So I was really interested in that, in that they found a solution that wasn't normally like in um, uh, Wonder Woman, which was, Wonder Woman was lovely. But in the end, she had to beat the evil guy by fighting him physically with power and overpowering him and therefore she won whereas Doctor Strange had an interesting twist to that anyway it's a yeah, it's, I find true. it interesting because we, we're almost trapped in this structure of movies to relive the individual overcoming obstacles because that's what's easy to watch you know it, it is nice to watch I mean I watch well don't get me wrong I watch all the Avengers movies I, I like them but but I find the solutions are always disappointing because they almost always involve being more violent or stronger than your opponent and I don't know if that is going to lead, has led us, it may have led us into global warming, into, you know, political issues that we have. You know, it, it's, it's quite possible that that kind of narrative is limiting. And I think that there's more interesting narratives. And those narratives are actually being explored in television. So interesting, the TV series that don't always have to be that one, you know, sort of what one or two hour long sort of, you know, 120 minute structure. They do things a little bit differently sometimes. And so you have more complicated solutions to problems in the TV series world, which is, I think, maybe also why people are drawn towards TV now, um, besides just the impact of Netflix and, you know, um, there's the stories that are being told there are more nuanced and more interesting, and the solutions being offered to the problems posed by the narrative are, I think, more interesting in the television space at the moment. And maybe more so, too, with art house cinema? Yes, I think so, yeah, yeah. Art house cinema has always been a place where that's been explored in some ways. Um, but I was, yeah, you know, um, I watched, I've been, looking, I've been looking to watch some movies while I'm here because, you know, I'm in America, I want to watch movies in America because it's a different experience watching movies in America as to watching them abroad. Because in America, when you're abroad, you're watching, um, it's almost like, American movies are foreign films, which is bizarre because I grew up with the television, American television, as much as you guys did here. And I've watched lots of movies, but they're still foreign in a way. But you're here, you're like, okay, these are people here. They all speak this accent and they're all here. And this is the world that they're presenting. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's interesting watching American movies in America. There's probably something to that. But uh, I couldn't really find anything to watch at the cinema. I was, it was a bit sad. I was like, AMC Dino, I love it, as I said before. What can I watch? And then there were a few you know, feel-good alternative smaller stories, but they were the feel-good alternative smaller stories that I've seen a hundred times. And I'm like, I'm not really interested in that anymore. So, yeah, it was difficult to find something. I'd rather watch TV. Maybe they should have AMC diners and they show TV series. There you go. <laughs> well, um, there's some great hard, art house cinema in LA. It's, it's excellent. Um, and, and the stories do 
feel to me more satisfying. Awesome. And, and they're not the the endings. Of course, is not it's not always a neat mm -hmm. packaged ending. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of them. So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, I've said it many times. So. so you talk about the three wells in your book. How does someone know which well they should tap into for their story? So. It's a good question. I can very quickly, shall I quickly explain the three wells Please so do, you can yeah. see what they are? Um, it's a very simple concept. It's, uh, and it's linked to meditation, what we've spoken about before, is when I slow down the moment of creativity, so if I'm writing and there's that flashing cursor and I'm seeing that flashing cursor in front of me, you know, where you're writing on your document and I can draw from three distinct sources within myself in that moment of creation. The first is other movies that I've seen or anything that I've read, books that I've read, any media that I've consumed um, that is not that I haven't created. I call that the external source as well. Um, then the other one I can tap into is the imagination well, which feels like a lightning bolt from above. It's just imagination. I just make it up. Feels like I've made it up. Feels like it's come out of nowhere. And that's the imagination well. And then the third well is the memory well, which is my own deep memories that I can tap into um, but it's difficult to go there sometimes, but they're mine. They're like my lived experiences. All my senses were alive when I experienced whatever it was that I've experienced. And so those are the three different wells. And when we write, we just uh, automatically tap into whichever one when we're writing. It depends on who we are, depends on what we're writing. Um, so uh, if I say to you now very quickly, I will just try and do this experiment. Um, imagine a, a, a scene set in a... Um, cemetery or a graveyard and you have to imagine some images that come to your mind chances are the first thing that you imagine are from external sources as well green grasses headstones um, priests standing with a little bible it's raining maybe it's raining maybe they've got umbrellas all the stuff that is in the external source as well but when we write we often write that's the first thing we write it's very easy to access and very good if you're writing to a deadline to write to the external source as well the imagination while is a bit more tricky if i say imagine a a scene set in a graveyard that you've never seen before. It becomes a bit of a, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Or something happens there that you've never imagined before. Then it becomes more difficult, but sometimes you can have an idea. It's like, ha, and then you write, and your imagination just kind of flies. Or if I say, imagine a cemetery that you've been to, that you've experienced, or something that you've seen in a cemetery. And then you have to kind of slow your life down. It's more difficult to access that. But then you can sometimes draw from that, and you'll find really interesting stuff there. So when we're writing unconsciously, when I write unconsciously, I'm very often tapping into the external source as well. I'm writing movies that have existed before. I'm maybe imagining stuff up, but I'm not putting any bit of me in it because it's difficult to do that for me. Some people, by the way, just like write from the memory well immediately and they just like they only write stories that, they, that they've experienced. And then they still, sometimes they write stories that are so much in their memory well that they're boring and they need to start tapping into the external source as well and write, you know, draw from some other movies, draw structure from other movies or scenes or something and imagine a bit more to make your story a bit more. So it doesn't, it, there's no real clear distinction as to which well you should tap into when you write. It depends what you're writing. It depends what stage you are at writing it. Um, I have a, a, a personal preference for the memory well because I believe that's where a lot of authenticity and resonance comes in. Um, and I think even if you're writing a slasher horror movie and you've drawn mostly from... So that horror movie I wrote was basically... Um, oh, uh, the Hills Have Eyes, which was a old um, movie. They redid it recently. Uh, it was that. Uh, mixed with a little, some personal experiences that I've had. But um, if you're writing a slasher movie, you may not have to draw from your memory well that much, but maybe if you've written something and you've really written it and you want to pimp it up a bit, go to each scene and even think of the location and then draw from your own memory and say, wait, have I been in a location like that or similar to that? And what was my experience there? What stayed with me in my memory? And then you put that into your scene. It can be something small like the sound of cicadas or something. Just put it in your scene. Suddenly it's like, ooh, it's alive. Because you remember that from your actual lived experience. And then suddenly you can make a scene that is a bland scene, really, really uh, resonant. So yeah, that's where... So it depends on which well you want to tap into at which time, depending on what you're writing. I know that when my publisher first asked me to... My publisher said, if I'm writing, a, can you not have a graph that says, okay, if you're writing a slash horror movie, it's got to be 80% external source as well, 10% uh, imagination, and then 10% memory. I'm like, well, not really. I'd love to be able to say that, but that's not really the way it works. The creative process is a lot more organic, so much so that when you're writing, you might not be consciously aware of what well you're tapping into. 
And then only when you rewrite, you might say, wait a minute, I've just copied all other movies here. Can I put something else in? Or this is just my story. No one's going to relate to it. How can I find other stories and put maybe be inspired by the structure or characters from other stories and put them into my story? So yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because there's not just one well that you have to tap into at a time. All three are happening at once. And you can pump your story up by suddenly being more imaginative. You know, you've set your scene here, yeah, but wait, imagine maybe it's somewhere else. Play, be like a child, you know, just play and imagine. Okay, my scene is set in the living room, but could it be set in a, uh, I don't know, like a, a, a roller coaster ride? Maybe. And then try it, it doesn't work. Well, it wouldn't work, but at least you were using your imagination for a while. Some yeah. living rooms are like roller coaster rides. <laughs> it depends true. on the living room. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> depends on what's going Depending on. Depending on what's going on in the living room, yeah, it could be a roller coaster ride. Let's suppose someone's tapping into the memory well. The memory well is very traumatic. Is that a signifier that that's where they should be writing then? So, the th you know, I'm not a qualified therapist, but the person in me, my gut answer is yes, definitely. But there's a caveat around that, which is that the memory well can have some traumatic stuff in it. And, uh, if you're not in a safe space and you're writing from it and you're writing something that's traumatic, it could open wounds. So I think you need to be supported if you're gonna be writing from that. You need to feel supported. You need to have therapists, you need to have family members, you need to have a friend, you need to have a husband or a support structure. You need support structures in place, I think, if you're gonna write from that space because it can result in people accessing stuff that's really traumatic for them. But I do believe that that's where the true healing happens for you as a writer, which is really important. And then maybe the healing can happen for the world. If you can express that space that you've been to in a way that others can watch it and go, yes, I've also been hurt. I have the same wounds as you. They're just different. That can really heal the world. But it's a, it is a, um, so yeah, that's why my answer is, as you can see, I'm excited. I'm like, yes, we must write the stuff that hurts us. But it can be difficult. And my caveat is, especially if you're going to be using this in an educational environment, you've got to be careful about the safe space that you create. Ironically, people are very eager to share that. If you give them an opportunity, a safe space, they're actually very eager to go there. But it can result. You've got to be careful with what you're doing. But yeah, I would say that's the stuff. It resonates with you. It's scary for you. It's challenging to write. I have something I want to write, my next story, and it's like, I am so scared of writing this thing. But I feel like I'm going to do it because it's, it's a story that hasn't really been told. And it's, it's, but that, that hesitation that I have, I think is a good thing. I've got to push through that and, and get into it. Yeah. It's really interesting you talk about that safe space. I remember being in a class that was not a writing class, but somebody shared something that was just devastating. Yeah. And I felt that the teacher didn't protect this person and allowed the other students to just throw advice on what they needed. And I, I saw the change in the person wow. and I wanted to say something to them. I couldn't because I felt like it wasn't my place, yeah. but it wasn't, it wasn't a safe space. Mm. And so I think that that is an interesting engaging. Yep. If I tell this story, how are people going to react? Because not everybody's going to be like, wow, that's great that you would share that. Yeah. Some people. Absolutely. It's so difficult. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, I've been doing this kind of work. So, so the book came out of um, somehow feeling that people needed to tap into their memories and share what they have experienced in screenwriting more because a lot of the sto stories that my students were writing were half-remembered stories from other movies they'd seen or weird imagined stuff always to do with pregnancy or prostitution or something. I don't know why the students are always interested in that kind of drugs or gangs <laughs> or something like not to do with their life. And they would always write pastiches of stuff. Um, and when I got them to write something from their life, like the day it all changed, some really powerful, just a three scene thing, you know, it was amazingly powerful. But I found that I had to create a really safe space to do that. Um, so I, I often have the class sit in a circle. I even sometimes make us hold hands and like pass a little pulse around the hands. Um, you know, you can only really share when it's your turn. Um, and I've had tears, people cry, people laugh. It's a very amazing space and you know I've had one or two students share where I've said look you know you should go and speak to someone professionally do you have anyone in your life you can speak to and then I will pass them on to a counselor if that's needed but it it is very important to create that safe space and I do say in my book like this is powerful stuff 
if you're going to teach from it, create a safe space. And um, yeah, and I've actually had some feedback from people who've said like, I've done some of your exercises, but I had to kind of tone them down a bit. Like the one was um, write your saddest memory. She's changed it to write your saddest memory for the month. You know, something sad that happened to you this month. So you can you can adjust it. But yeah, you can imagine if you're writing that, it can be really, really moving and, and powerful. Yeah, have to have a safe space. Story sloth to story sleuth. Oh. What is that? <laughs> You've seen bits of my book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, story Sloth to Story Sleuth is about... So one of the ways we access the memory well is through senses and being aware of the world when you're in it. And very often, um, I find for myself, I my thing that has been taught me through the world is to disconnect from the world. Lie on the couch, watch TV. Read a book. Even reading a book is an escape. I love it, but I must admit it's an escape. Um, because, you know, the world is a, a place where there can be many things that we feel can injure us. And when we grow up, often as a kid, you know, things just happen and you're like, oh, I need to protect myself. I'm going to just like veg off and watch TV screens. Which is, by the way, more and more happening now. I went out to dinner the other day and there were just kids. All the kids had screens. The place even had screens for the kids. I was like, wow. Uh, and so we can numb ourselves and turn into a bit of a sloth. You know, we can lie on the couch and just be a sloth. So for me, uh, a story sloth is somebody who just sits at home on the couch and just like numbs out. And then when they're writing, they're writing from a sort of a numbed out position almost. But a story sleuth is someone who's looking at the world, being open to the world, investigating the world, constantly finding stories everywhere, because they are everywhere. And to do that, we have to be open to the world, slightly in some ways. We have to have our magnifying glass and look at the world and be open to it and allow our senses to op be operate and be present. This is, again, it links up to meditation, but being present in the moment of the world unfolding around us in order to be open to those stories that are out there. It can be traumatized. For me, it can be, I, I'm like, I mean, I'll see somebody walking across the road carrying a like a flip file and they're going somewhere and they're in a hurry and they dress smartly and I'm oh that guy's going to a job interview and he looks so traumatized and I hope he gets his job interview like you know I can relate so much to the world it can sometimes be a bit overwhelming but I do think that that for the, is a trick for a writer is, is to be a story sleuth and to go out there and find the stories because they are everywhere I mean they, they can be overwhelming as to how many stories they are actually so if you're ever stuck and often my, my book you know the, the byline is never be stuck again because it's about breaking through writer's block breaking through that that limit that we can feel if we walk around as story sleuths there are just stories everywhere and I mean it can maybe that can be overwhelming but also you could just write the story of the guy going to his job interview and that'll open up something um, so yeah for me this the the movement from story sloth to story sleuth is moving from the couch into the world and there's a great quote which is something like how vain it is to sit down and write when you haven't stood up to live and I like that oh, wow we need to stand up to live before we sit down to write. Oh, that's, that's and, great. Yeah. So that's the story, story sleuth going out there looking for stories and living in the world and being present and being open. You know, not too much because that can also drive you insane. But yeah, yeah. Have you experienced writer's block? Um, yes. I think I have experienced writer's block. Probably quite a lot. Um, I have a trick that I do, a few tricks that I do to avoid writer's block. But one of them is if I'm writing something I, and I know that there's a really exciting scene that I'm going to write and I'm like heading up to that scene, then I'll just start writing the scene and I'll stop. I won't finish writing it so that the next day when I have to sit down to write, I'm very excited about finishing that scene. When I experience writer's block, I almost feel like I've written everything out that I've got in me already in that one session of writing. And then I'm like, Puh. And then the next morning I wake up and I'm like, oh, well, where to now? So the excitement of writing helps, it helps me to stop writing a scene in the middle of the scene that I really want to write and then keep that excitement for the next day. But that means already that I'm in a writing space where I'm writing every day. But to get into the place where you're writing every day can be even more difficult, I think. And that's where the blocks, that's a bigger block, I think. When people talk about writer's block, I think they're often talking about sitting in front of the computer stuck. For me, it's real writer's block is I'm not even sitting in front of the computer. I'm not even near a computer. I'm like, 
I'm somewhere else. I'm like, I don't know, on the couch or I'm, I'm not even, you know, I'm, I'm eating breakfast or I'm, I'm not even at the computer yet. That's where the real blocks happen because I'm not feeling that I have enough to say. Once I'm sitting at the computer, then another kind of a block can happen. But that's easily overcome by just writing anything. Professional writers do that. You know, they just write every day. They just force themselves through the writing. And even if what they're writing they know is terrible, it's fine. Well, I'll come back and I'll fix it later in the edits. And then that's, a, that's maybe a different kind of writer's block. But yeah, I've experienced both kinds. The sort of not even being able to sit in front of the computer writer's block and then the sitting in front of the computer feeling, feeling blocked. It's a, it's a strange space, but um, for me, it does help to be able to tap into these wells. Like, okay, wait, wait what's my memory on this? Uh, I actually do have an interesting memory around this. Huh. And then writing it. Or, um, okay, wait a minute. Let me just be imaginative. Let me just be playful. Let me just imagine something totally random. And it's probably terrible, but I'm going to write it anyway. Um, or what other movies have I seen? Oh, yeah, there was a scene. Oh, that was cool. I can write that. So for me, tapping into the wells breaks through the writer's block very, very easily and very effectively. Yeah. And there, aren't there many schools of thought on, on writer's block, even somewhere they say there is no such mm -hmm. thing as writer's block? Yeah. I think... This is why when you ask me, have I ever experienced writer's block? I'm like, hmm, define writer's block. I don't really know when people talk about writer's block. And um, I don't mention it in my book. I just say never be stuck again. And I talk about um, the wells and how they can help us be creative. Because I don't really know how to define writer's block. Um, I think there may be many different kinds. Like as I'm talking about it now, I'm actually realizing, yeah, there's different kinds of writer's block. There's like resistance to writing in general. Then there's sitting in front of the computer and feeling like what you're writing is terrible and therefore not being able to write. So maybe that's two different kinds. And then, I don't know, maybe there's another kind, but yeah, I can think of two right now. Um, and a lot of professional writers will say, no, there's no such thing as writer's block. You just sit down and write. And there is, there is that. You just sit down and just type the words. And what it feels like is it feels like I'm writing something that's really terrible. And this feels disgusting. But what I've learned to do is just push through that and write the disgusting stuff and then fix it later. Yeah. How can a writer develop characters using the three wells of screenwriting? Okay, that's... It's kind of super easy. It's one of the easiest ways to... So I've got a chapter in the book on, on writing characters from using the three wells. And just to give you an idea, um, if you have a character, and they can be a very minor character or, or a major character, but I'll just use a minor character for an, ex for an example because it can show you how kind of powerful the wells can be. Um, if, for example, you've got a character that's walking into a store and they have some dealing with a store clerk. You know, there's a clerk, at the, a clerk at, the, at the store and they're doing something and they have some dialogue between them. Um, so this is a minor character. The store clerk is some minor character who you could just write as store clerk one. But if you want to kind of use the three wells to maybe pump up that character a bit, you can look at your external source as well and make a list of characters from movies that you like. They could be absolutely random characters, but then they should be in a way. Just, I like this character, I like this character, I like, you know, the guy from The Shining, I like, um, I don't know, just anyone I like. Uh, okay, the Michael Corleone from The Godfather. I'm thinking of all the good movies now for some reason. Um, what have I watched recently? I like the Spider-Man's best buddy in Spider-Man. He's funny. And you make a list of all the movies, characters from other movies you've seen. And then you take your store clerk, your store clerk and you say, could he be Spider-Man's buddy from that other movie? He could be Spider-Man's buddy from the other movie. And suddenly your imagination, well, is kind of lighting up because you're making a collision of two things. And suddenly you've got this oh wait, what happens if he was Spider-Man's buddy from the other movie? And then the clerk suddenly has a character, he's got glasses, he's a bit chubby, and he's like really funny, and maybe he's like, you know, wearing a, I don't know, maybe he's, maybe what you buy from him, he says something about linked up to movies or, or, or um, comic books, and now you've got a character suddenly just from, from doing that. So that's, a, it's almost like a, uh, like a Rolodex, you're flipping through all these characters that exist before and putting them in, in kind of minor parts of your movie. You can do it with a major character, but then you need to take elements from, different characters and put them together. And so you take, you know, the sort of, I don't know, the anger of one character mixed with the daddy issues with another character mixed with uh, something from, and then you can create sort of composite characters using other movies. It can be really fun. 
uh, and can be really effective and can spark off your imagination well. This is how you do it. You, you kind of collide ideas together. And in that collision of store clerk and Spider-Man's buddy, your imagination has just suddenly gone off. And he's suddenly a much clearer character. By the way, when you write that into your script, when you read the script, the character leaps off the page because suddenly your minor characters have become really, really interesting. Um, the other really fun thing is to go into your memory well and go, hmm, clerks that I've experienced in my life. <laughs> Okay, that could be one thing you could do. Or you could say, um, I'm by the way, this is what it looks like. Tapping into the memory well always takes a bit longer because you have to kind of look into your own life. And it's like, hmm, it slows down a bit. And you're like, um, okay, so there's this guy, Kevin. Yeah, he's a buddy of mine. He's got his hair shaved on the side. He's got tattoos all over him. And he's kind of like quite a fun guy. He's a bit strange. He's got an interesting way of talking. What happens if he was the clerk? Oh yeah, that could work. Or maybe it won't work at all. Maybe so some of the characters, but but what you can access in your memory wall is absolutely unique characters that no one's seen before. And then suddenly they're the store clerk and then suddenly your, your store, store, store clerk leaps off the page. I actually had this experience in the story that I wrote. I think I talk about it in the book where I had a, um, a, a manager in a music store. So one of my characters had a, she made her own um, songs and she was trying to get her songs on. She, she would put them onto like a DVD, a, a disc, like a CD, and try and sell it to the store. But the store clerk, uh, the idea was that she's not going to get that sold because the store clerk, she's like, it's against company, company policy. And the store clerk, I just chose this random guy from my life, totally tattooed everywhere, piercings everywhere, long hair, slightly effeminate. I think he might go by another gender at the moment. It's, I'm not sure, but he or she... Uh, is the store clerk now in the in the movie? And awesome. suddenly the character was really alive and he was interesting. And and my uh, character was trying to sell her songs. Had a baby and she was holding the baby. And at some point she passes it to the store clerk manager. And now he's <laughs> holding this baby and he's like, it's against company policy. And it's like, is it, does he mean holding the baby or does he mean the CD? And suddenly there was like a whole interaction. So. Drawing from the memory well in your minor characters can really pump it up. But also, I think, um, in the major characters. So when you... Creating character is is a real art form, actually. And, and you know, people spend a lot of time you trying to watch your backstory of your character, what's the history of your character. And there's, there's some, something about being able to empathize with your character. Sometimes you have to draw from your own experiences around something similar to what that character's gone through. And then suddenly it becomes really real for you. And then suddenly it starts resonating for you. And that character matters to you. And then you write from that position. So that's a summary of how you can um, beef up characters using the three wells. Yeah. There's like a whole that. chapter on it, so you'd have to, to get into it. might take a while. But yeah, those, those little samples. I mean, I promise you, you just go through your script, take all your minor characters, use the external source well or your memory well, and your script will suddenly have a lot more life. And when people read it, they'll go, oh, wow, that character leaps off the page. What's he done different? Well, not much. He's just attached something to them so they, yeah, so they're real, I guess. It's about trying to create something that is a real space for the reader. I like that. I like that clerk analogy because mm. you, you could think to ones in movies, but then yeah. you can also think to ones that you experienced that you first maybe didn't think about yeah. or ones that really stood out, whether they were really nice or exactly. one time I had someone accuse me of stealing something oh, no. and he accused me right at the register. What? And I said, oh, you didn't see the receipt for the thing in the bag oh. from the other store that I went to? And then it was like this awkward, you want to talk about it, awkward moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. I love but, that story. Yeah, and it was great because then That's I so had cool. to keep seeing him, but I knew in the back of my mind, oh, and wow. he knew, oh, and I didn't say anything. I wasn't going to call him out or. You know. That's amazing. But I, that was such a vivid memory of interacting with a clerk. And yeah. then there's been great times when you yeah. joke around and yeah. they're, they're fun and. But but that's true. It seems like such a minor thing. But if you look back, and then if you look back, what you've told me now is a scene that's got subtext, amazing subtext, like going back to the store when you know and he knows. And right. There's great subtext there, and that's the stuff that really works in movies. You know. Um, so actually, a movie that I haven't seen is The Farewell, which is. Um, I was just going to go see that. Okay. Wow, how weird. Yeah. Well, okay. that's one movie that I think is going to be really interesting, and I, I heard the podcast that it's based on because. This American Life did a podcast of the fair, basically the farewell was a podcast many years ago, and she went and wrote the movie and now directed it. That movie I think is going to have many moments of subtext, absolute complex subtext because of the structure of the movie, but also because it's based on a memory well. It's all from a memory well, and so that kind of everyone's trying to teach how to write subtext. It's very difficult. You almost have to either the characters must be so alive, or you have to draw from life. 
and then you get that immediately. You talk about story and subtext. It's in your one memory that popped up in your. Right. When I mentioned clerk, you were like, ha ha. Yes. I've got that already. And everyone's <laughs> got that. And yours is unique. If you wrote that scene, it would be a unique story. Sure. Yeah, anyway. sure. That's so funny that you mentioned yeah. the farewell. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. We may have already covered this, but. I'll ask it anyway, because you never know. It might lead somewhere. Okay, sure. If we, you like. Yeah. Realistic dialogue using the three wells oh, of screenwriting. Wow. Yeah. So there is, again, a chapter in the book around dialogue and, and using the three wells of writing dialogue. I find, for me, writing dialogue was really difficult in the beginning. Some people can just write dialogue. Oh, by the way, I was going to call my book, You Can't Teach Screenwriting, because I wonder sometimes if you can teach screenwriting. And dialogue writing in particular is something that some people come to my classes and they just write brilliant dialogue. I'm like, how did you do this? What do you do? But people are open to the world. Again, it's about being open to the world and listening to the way people speak. Um, and also understanding that if you set a scene in your movie, it's got to be as realistic as your own life. So in your memories, if you're writing a divorce scene or say a scene where someone breaks up with someone, often what I find people write on the nose dialogue. So they're like, I am breaking up with you now. And I'm like, when I broke up with people, did I ever say those words? <laughs> I don't think I ever used those words. And I've broken up with some people, unfortunately. Um, and if you go into your own memory well and you look at how, how did that happen with me? Is there anything I can draw from this? Was there a moment or was it just like silence? It's not working anymore. What isn't working? I don't know, this whole thing. It's just, and you look at the sea and maybe you parked your car on the seafront and you're like, yeah, it's been many years, but I think it's definitely time that we just... You know, and then, okay. <laughs> you know, so you don't actually say, uh, in life, very often we don't say like these very clear moments. However, the difference between life dialogue and screen dialogue is that we do have to clearly communicate to the audience that they're breaking up. So, you know, it's kind of this where you go to your external source as well and say, well, how did they do it in that movie? And do I need to actually say at some point, I do have to say we are broken up officially so the audience understands that they're broken up. And this is the difficulty between what I call... Um, street dialogue and screen dialogue. And well, stage dialogue is also different because stage dialogue is all about the words and the, you know, often, not all stage plays, but often stage plays is about language, it's about the, you know, the uses of language. And street dialogue is totally different, but screen dialogue, as a writer, you're writing because you have to communicate some information to an audience through your characters. And that's the delicate balance, is using your memory well to write realistic sounding dialogue, but then also using the external source as well and knowing that it's um, it's got to serve a purpose. It's got to move the story forward. So sometimes it has to be slightly on the nose, but it shouldn't be too on the nose, obviously. So yeah, that's how you would do it. But I find some of the difficulty I had with first-time writers is trying to communicate to them that what you're writing must be as real as life. You know, it's got to be, even if it's set in space, you know? Like, Avengers keeps coming up. Like, Iron Man leaving that message for Pepper Potts when he's floating up in space. It's got to be real. You're in space, but it's got to be real. So he can't say the things he wants to say. And then he'll eventually say them because you want the characters to care about him. But it'll take him a while. And that's why that scene kind of works really well because it's it feels real. And and often when, when first-time writers write, they don't write like that. And so how to teach that? I don't know how you teach that. But you got to draw from your life. You got to draw from your life experiences. You need to be, uh, you know, you need to be empathetic with your characters. And teaching that is difficult. So that's where the three wells came from as well. Is that I found when people started drawing from their own lives, they were like, "Oh, it's really easy. That's how people speak." I'm like, "Yeah." And they should speak like that in your movie as well, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. And sorry, the other thing is the symbolism sleuth. Is if you're going out there and you're listening to what people sound like when they speak, that's also very important. Especially if you've got regionally specific accents, um, and you got to write that. Then you got to go listen. You know, got to listen to the way people speak. That's and very true. Yes, because I have, especially here in LA, you'll hear people from all over. It's amazing. And, and the different things that they'll say and the terminology. Yes. I exactly. remember one lady. I'm not sure where she was from, but she was like, "They're going to call the law on him," and that meant the police were coming. And I was, "Oh yeah, that's right. Okay." That's good. And I didn't know. Right. And I thought, like, "Wow, yeah. I like that. Call that's the law. cool." You know. And then you'll hear other people that you know just just different terminology for so things so. that we would call something else. Yes. You know, you'd asked about principal versus yeah. headmaster. Mm -hmm. yep. and, uh, There's so many, in LA in particular, I'm just noticing all these different accents everywhere. It's overwhelming. I'm like, even the, the waitress who served us last night, I was like, where the hell is she from? I can't place her at all. Anyway, but it, it's, it's interesting. She had such a unique way of speaking. It was just like, 
it sounded like she was a, I don't know, she had a high pitched voice, but it was also like she was a sports ca caster or something, but she was also maybe Spanish like background. I don't know, it was difficult for me to figure out what she was saying most of the time. But it's difficult for people to figure out what I'm saying most of the time as well. That's really funny. Anyway, speaking of dialogue, this is a total aside, but it's just a funny thing that happens to a South African in LA. It's really funny. Is this, um, so I was surfing and this guy was surfing and he's bored he fell off his board and his board was, I picked his board up and I gave it to him. I was on the shore and I said something like, oh, I see your board has got space for two fins, which is anyway, which is a strange sentence you wouldn't normally say, but I could see his face and his face was like, this human being is talking to me. <laughs> I think he's talking to me in English. It's definitely English and he's confident in English, but it's not American. And then I said it again and then he was like, okay, he is speaking English and he is very confident in it. <laughs> I need to like adjust my brain to understand what he's saying. And then I spoke it again and then he was like, you know, he understood me. But it's really funny to see that happen here. It's just a, a total aside, but it's in terms of dialogue, you know, like the, the miscommunication that can happen with dialogue is really funny. And then the subtleties, the subtext, it's, man, it's just, I find it really funny because like English is my home language. This is the way I speak. But when I speak it here, every time I see this look on people's face, it's classic. It's the like, this man is not from America and he's talking to me. I've never spoken to a South African before. I don't know what the space is. It's really a great look. Anyway, I'm sure Trevor Noah understands. Luckily for Trevor Noah, thank goodness for Trevor Noah, he's opened up the door to there South African go. accents. Yeah. Right. And the Musk family too. So. Exactly. And the Musk family. Good for you, Elon. Are you anti-plot, against plot, um, in the middle? So... I'm definitely not against plot. I wrote sitcom for 25 years. It's all about plot. Advert breaks happen at certain times. You need to have certain things happen at certain places to motivate the advert breaks. Um, interestingly enough, now though, with television not having so many advert breaks, you know, with Netflix where you it's on demand and so you don't, you know, don't have your advert breaks. I think I do think plot's changing slightly. The three act structure and the terminology around the three act structure that's developed over the years, um, it's really useful after you've written something, I find. Um, and I, I just can't get this out of my head, but for me, it feels like human beings have been telling stories for thousands of years before we've been analyzing them. So like we told stories naturally around the campfires. You know, we told stories about the hunt, about where to find the animals. There was some sort of structure in that in a way. Yes, there was a main character trying to find an animal and there was following clues. And so there was some sort of a structure already to that, which is maybe a universal myth, I'm not sure. but. We've been telling stories for a long time, longer than we've been analyzing stories. So for me, plot um, and the analysis of plot can be a real um, source of people getting stuck in their writing because they feel that they need to have a plot that works before they write. Now, if you just write without a plot, you can also end up down a dark hole of loose ends that you know lead nowhere and just write for the rest of your life without having a structure. But I find plot and the analysis of plot um, a good place to be once you've written something. But for me, plot arises out of characters in a space doing something. And that creates the plot. The characters themselves are almost... Uh, it's like this whole separation of character and plot is, is not actually real when you're either creating it or watching it. Character and plot are intrinsically linked. Um, we separate them in order to analyze and maybe in the rewrite, write our stories better. But I do find that, so if you just focus on plot and drop the characters, um, it can result in stories that are, feel a bit empty. Um, and it can result in stories that everyone's written before. What I find really funny about these books on plot, um, and some really good books are written on plot and I point to them in my book, I don't talk about plot at all in my book. What I find really funny about books on plot is they'll say, these seven beats need to be in a story. They don't have to be there in that order. They don't all have to be there. And I'm like, what do you mean they don't have to be there in that order and they don't all have to be there? This is kind of, it's like a weird, I don't know if you've read close to these, but they've all got this disclaimer of like, you know, they don't have to be in that order and they don't have to necessarily all be there. And I'm like, well, what are you really trying to say? So I'm slightly suspicious of generating your idea writing from plot first. I think it can be really useful in the rewrite. It's definitely really useful in the story edit. I use it all the time when I'm trying to help writers strengthen, the, strengthen their stories. But actually, the best bit on plot that I've ever heard, the best quote on plot, and it's not even about plot, it's from that book on filmmaking that I mentioned earlier by Alexander McKendrick. He says something like, the only thing you need to know, what's happening now in your story should not be as exciting 
or uh, interesting as what may or may not happen later. It's really simple. Oh, wow. What is happening now shouldn't be as interesting or exciting as what may or may not happen later. So something's happening later and it's drawing the story forward. And it's that thing that's happening later that you need to put in your plot somewhere. So we need to know that something's going to happen in the, you know, you need to set it up so that something's going to pay off and that'll drive the story forward and that'll keep people watching. But I like that because it's kind of an escapist, you know, it's not really about plot, but it's kind of linked to structure in some way. So yeah, I, I'm not anti-plot, but um, as a matter of fact, I'm pro-plot when it comes to analysis of the story and trying to make it stronger. Because I do believe you have to take a sledgehammer to your story once you've written it and hit it. And if it breaks, something's wrong with the structure. And so you need to like make it work. Um, but I sometimes find that a lot of the... Even when people use plot to analyze movies, they try and identify like the inciting incident and they do it in the same movie and they identify different places. And I'm like, what is this? It's not an exact science. I think writing isn't an exact science and people who claim that it's an exact science are actually lying. In my experience of writing is it's not an exact science. It's, uh, it's a bit different to that. And so, yeah, so I, I kind of worry about the usefulness of extremely plot-driven writing books. They can be useful for some people in some places, and I wrote from that for a lot of my life. What is taking a sledgehammer to your story, though? Like, how do you metaphorically do that? So, yeah, I always think of it like this. Um, when I... When you write from a character-driven sort of perspective or from a maybe a more organic perspective, you tentatively connect scenes together to form a sort of like a structure. And it can be a very fragile, crystalline structure. <laughs> it might not be very strong. And taking a sledgehammer to it means asking yourself those really hard questions that structure sort of asks you to ask in a way, is like, what is your character want now and have you told us it early enough you know and you hit it and it's like oh if it survives it survives or um when is the transition into the new world or when is our transition into the second act is that strong enough is it clear enough that's another so these are the kind of taking a sledgehammer to your story and if it falls apart then mm, it's probably not strong enough but if it's really crystalline strong enough structure and it holds then maybe your story is good enough that's kind of what i meant by taking a sledgehammer it's all those difficult questions that story execs will ask you or you know, um, people who read lots of books will ask you, and 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 I think, I think we we do have to do that. We can't be precious about our stories either, even though they these for me they can be really beautiful creations that come out of a place of good intention. At some point, they're gonna that you know your audience is gonna hit sledgehammers at it, and does it hold? Does it not hold? Yeah, you have to you have to put it through the ringer a bit. That's when you bring in Rob McKee. They do that with screenwriting videos too, trust yeah. me. <laughs> no, they do. I know, it's hilarious. I wonder sometimes how useful they are. Um, they may be useful. Um, I definitely came from that position in the beginning when I was when I first taught, um, definitely. I was all like, you know, um, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. It was just like the sort of... But there's an anger around that sometimes, and I wonder about that. I actually do question where that's coming from. Where is this sort of anger towards story um, so I was coming from a place of insecurity because I was I didn't really you know, I hadn't written much I was like you know and I was like oh my god these students what am I going to do I'll be strict because if I'm strict then they'll listen to me and I've changed now I'm a lot more softer and I'm a lot more nurturing in the way that I help people birth their stories into the world as opposed to you know try and kill them as they arrive so yeah <laughs> yeah I suppose I am I am actually suspect of um of where that the intention is coming from in the in the shouty story people that can shout at people you know the drill master story guy i'm like ah, i don't know it seems to be coming from a misled place let's just say like the into, scene in forest oh, gump this is my first interview in la and i'm gonna get kicked out of the town no you know, no no like the scene in forest gump gump you know and he's like right in his face and he, yeah. what is story you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just. that is a great skit oh my god i'm gonna do that that is genius Resonance, that's mm, your first chapter? Yeah. Mm. What, tell us what that's about. So resonance for me is, um, I have a quote in that chapter. My book's got quotes in every chapter, so I'll have a lot of quotes in this interview. But I have a quote in that chapter that begins with, which is this. It is, it's a complicated quote, and it might not be easily to understand, easy to understand just saying it, but it's a quote from Gustave Flaubert, uh, Madame Bovary. And the quote is, um, 
uh, something like, language is a cracked kettle on which we beat out tunes for bears to dance to, while all the while we long to move the stars to pity. So it means language is, we want to move the stars to pity with our language. We want our language to be this beautiful thing that expresses everything we're feeling and expresses our emotions, but actually language is a cracked kettle on which we're beating our tunes for bears to dance to. I don't know why bears are dancing, but it's like a language fails us when it comes to certain things, I really believe. I think certain things like religion and faith, language fails us and logic fails us at that point. And I also believe that with creation, when we create things, language fails us to really explain what's going on at the core of creativity and that moment of creativity, which is kind of what my book's about. So my little caveat is always with the word resonance. The word resonance came out of an inability to explain what happens to me when I'm watching a movie and I'm moved, or when I'm looking at a painting and I'm moved, or when I'm listening to a piece of music and I'm moved. I use the word resonance there because for me it feels like something in the painting is vibrating and it vibrates something in me and I resonate with it. And that's what I mean by resonance is I, I look at a painting, like for example, yeah, I look at a painting, for example, in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. There's this one particular painting that I saw, uh, Wheatfield with Crows, which is a beautiful painting, and it's just really moved. When I was in the museum looking at this painting, it really moved me and resonated with me in a really deep way. Um, I hope it wasn't because I was in Amsterdam and things can move you there, which shouldn't, but um, I'm sure it wasn't that. Uh, but other things move me. You know, paintings and moments and movies move me, particularly music will move me, characters behaving in a certain way will move me, and that movement and that resonance is what I'm trying to create um, in the scripts that my writers are, are writing is, how do we take that resonance, how do we make our audience, in reading a script, never mind watching it, but how do we make that them resonate with what's on the page? That for me is, is the real trick of writing. Um, and I do believe we're doing, we do that by doing what Hemingway says we do, which is, um, it's very easy, you just sit at the typewriter and bleed. <laughs> you know, we take our memory well, we put it on the stage, we put our pint of blood on the stage. And that's what the way we create resonance, because if it moved us in our memories, if it stayed in our memories for some way, so for some reason, it might have had a resonance, it might have this charge that we then put on the page and then people reading it resonate with it. So that's kind of what I mean by resonance. Of course, it can get really complicated because you do need structure sometimes to get to that point where people are moved. You know, you need to have certain things in place so that the, you know you, we care about the character, so that when they do something, we're moved by it. But I still believe that there are certain um, sort of events in our lives, even uh, objects and um, senses and sounds and touches and tastes, which if we take from our memory, where they have the, they carry this weight of resonance. You put them on the page, and there it is. And it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to, uh, to do consciously, but you can. Um, and it's also difficult to, to kind of talk about because it's so abstract, but you recognize it immediately when you see it. I mean, I know you know what I'm talking about, but it's difficult to kind of do it except by accessing your memories and being very vulnerable. It's also about being vulnerable, I think, and putting yourself out there. You're some, some of your vulnerability and then people will resonate with it, I think. Because if it's too much of just your own vulnerability, it becomes a manifesto exactly. without the structure. Exactly. Uh -huh. This is where, you know, what I always say is like, I don't want this book, I don't want to hear about your life, your boring life, because I actually don't. I want to hear about something else, maybe. You know, I don't want to just read about your life. I want to read about, I want aspects of your life to be present in the story you're telling. And that's different. The story you're telling is a story. It should have structure. It should have, you know, and it, but, but you put your memories in there, your aspects of it, and then it really starts to come alive. And uh, just to kind of go back to the uh, story structure thing, maybe, uh, and back to that Van Gogh painting, because I love that Van Gogh painting. I always use an example because I know, I don't know what Van Gogh was doing when he painted, but I know that he didn't have a test audience and he didn't read a book on screenwriting theory and he didn't put his painting up and say to everyone, right guys, look at this painting. Are there enough crows in this painting? We deal with crows. Are the, are the, do you want more yellow? And then hand out fly, you know, forms and then the audience all filled it in and then like handed it back to him and he changed it. So that didn't happen. So he was doing something else, which I think is, is he was resonating and he was just moving with emotion. He put that on the canvas. Now, of course, he didn't have to pay millions of dollars for that canvas, which is why you need maybe audience test subjects to give you, you know, see if your movie's working or not. But uh, if, if you write from a position of, okay, I've got to please an audience. I've got to make money out of this. And uh, let me read a book on structure. I don't know if you hit the resonance. Not always. 
What makes a great story? <laughs> I love the way you ask these questions. They're just like, here's this question I prepared earlier that is going to get to the heart of all the issues, all the questions I have. Um, okay, for me, a great story. I almost want to break this question into two. Okay. The escapist great story, as in Star Wars, um, Star Trek, James Bond, uh, spectacle movies, you know, uh, Born, the Born movies, which I love, all these things. Those are roller coaster ride, escapist stories, Jaws, you know, all these things. Is, is that, well, Jaws, not so much maybe because Jaws actually has some interesting stuff in there going on. But um, the other movies, all that, but, but uh, you can have these escapist movies and if those are great stories, they, they can be great stories, very enjoyable, they, you know, they're entertaining. Spider-Man Far From Home, I watched it in the cinema, surround sound, it was fine, it was escapist, it wasn't a great story, but you know, it was fun. I watched it, it was cool. Uh, I don't want to diss those stories, they can be great stories, but for me a great story is when you have, when I, when I leave the cinema and I have been granted a new way of looking at the world. And I leave the cinema and I'm like, I've got some insight into how to behave in the world in a different way that I had when I walked in. Which could be an insight into a character, beha character's behavior. They're behaving in a way that is interesting, complex, I can't quite understand what they're doing, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the world, leave the cinema in a way that shows me a different way of being in the world. That for me is a really great story. It's like we learn from stories, I think. You know, we learn how to behave in the world in stories. So if the story is teaching me something new about the world and my place in it, fantastic. And you don't have to do that by preaching. So The Godfather is clearly a great story. Michael Corleone's motivations are really complex and so complex that we question our own motivations. Like his motivation, he'll claim, is family is the most important thing to him. But at the end of the three, three movies, his wife's left him, his, she's had an abortion, uh, he's killed his brother, and his daughter's died in front of him. So he's no family. There's a great scene in the second one, I think, where he's sitting at the table and he's insisting on something. Everyone leaves until he's alone at the table. There is no family around anymore. So we're learning something about our own desires and our own drives and our own, you know, and we look at that and we go like, hmm, okay, he clearly wanted this, but he got this. In my own life, what do I want? And am I getting that? You know, so there's movies that question our own complexities as human beings. Those for me are great stories. Uh, they're few and far between, but you know, I, I, again, I don't know why I'm, I seem to be in the 70s, but that often is where I am when you talk about great stories. But I think, although I don't know Raging Bull, whether that was 70s, but you know, Raging Bull is another one of these stories where you're just like, um, they're complex characters and, and they're flawed and they're interesting and we leave there going like, that was perfect. Like, don't change a scene. But you, you looked into this character's life and now you've given me something in my own life and I've, I've resonated in some way, there's a resonance word again, with the character on the screen because it's a kind of a real portrayal of a person struggling with life without clear answers. And then we leave going, hmm. And then we may, our dealings with other people might be affected by that because we don't know what this person's been going through, you know? So it's like, yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question about it what does. makes a great story because I'm not telling you it needs to have three-act structure, it needs to have this and this and this, but it needs, when I leave the cinema, I want to leave the cinema a changed person in some way. I mean, that's my, my goal, ideally, yeah. And going back to the clerk analogy, mm. I actually had another positive experience where the clerk said, oh yeah, hey, how's your day going? And I said, oh, great, sorry, I, I spaced, I, I'm still thinking about the movie I just saw. Oh, so that amazing. right there tells you amazing. that it's affecting you 20 minutes later when exactly. you're going to- Exactly, and sometimes the stories, Cinema has that ability, you know, you're going into a darkened space for like an hour or two, it has all the chances in the world to affect your life. And you can just also just put someone in the world and you leave that cinema going, oh wow, I'm in that, I love that space. It's my favorite space, you know, where you leave and you carry the movie with you, it's great. Right, and you can, you can also see, I, there was a movie I saw where I felt so bad for this woman, I mean, she was really crying during the, I mean, oh, wow. just really breaking down. Jesus. And I think it affected her after the film. And you know, I just, let her Jeepers. be, and I'm not trying to like stare at yeah. her and make her feel bad, but I felt how affected she was wow. about this one scene. Jeepers. And it was probably because something similar just yeah. happened, something. Wow. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. That's amazing, yeah. you know, it's I hope a, it's, she's okay. It's, it's a powerful medium, and I think we, again, we have to be, well, we have to be careful because like, okay, I'm gonna go here because you can cut this off, but 
sometimes my students have, or people that write, that I've, that I've been working with, they, they'll write a scene often of domestic abuse because it's an issue that's, you know, people are, you know, we don't talk about it enough because it happens that the silence around it is a problem, but it happens and some of the people write it in the movie, but they'll write it in such a way um, and then maybe the movie gets made and, and, and it gets pr portrayed in such a way. I always say to them, what about the abuser in the cinema and the abused woman in the cinema? How are they going to feel about this? And then even the worst for me is rape scenes, you know, because there are a lot of them in movies. And I, how is a rapist going to feel in the cinema or a woman who's been raped? Because we, I think we have to think about these questions because I think if we want to reach the person whose life we want to either support or change, so I'm talking about the rapist in the room or the, the, the victim of abuse, we have to speak to those people and we have to be sensitive about what we're doing. And if you're having a scene where the guy is taking a woman's head and smashing it into a wall, Tarantino, um, what are you saying with that? What are you communicating? What's the person sitting there feeling? What are they feeling? What emotions are they feeling at that moment? Are they feeling like, yeah. It's a scary thought, but I do believe we carry that much power. So um, I don't know where that came from, but it came from your, oh, the woman who was affected by the scene in the movie that you were talking about. We, yeah, this is what we're dealing with, actually. We're dealing with a very powerful medium that can affect people. And so we have to ask ourselves that without, again, paralyzing ourselves. Almost ask yourself that question and go deeper into it. Okay, this is what's going to happen in the scene. And this is what I'm going to show. And this is the, these are the images that I'm going to put on the back of people's retinas and in their brains for the rest of their lives. And whether you like it or not, you got that in your brain from me. I don't know. I find it a, there's a responsibility there. With great power comes great responsibility. Anyway, maybe. Right. Yeah, I was just thinking of some quote, and I don't know who said it, but artists are the most dangerous because mm. they have the power to... Wow. Yeah, well, this is in Plato's The Republic, the artists are the first ones that he kicks out because he's like, no, got to control. In, you know, he wants to control the society, create the perfect society. Artists, painters, out, get out, banished. <laughs> <laughs> so we see it everywhere. Any authoritative regime will crack down on the artists and the journalists. How does a writer know the beginning of their story? So the beginning is a very difficult time, as Dune, the movie begins, which David Lynch made. He hates the movie, but there's a great quote in the beginning. I think she says, oh no, she says, the beginning is a very delicate time. So the beginning of a story is the most important part, I think. Um, the first 15 minutes, like any issues you have in your story, it's all going to eventually work back to the first 15, 10 minutes of your story. It really is a difficult time. Um, I think it's um, when you first write your story, chances are you're going to rewrite the beginning. So because you're going to get into some sort of a structural mess at some point, you're going to have to rearrange things and adjust it and come back to the beginning. Um, normally, the beginning is later than you think. So, you know, you may think your story begins here and you start writing it and then you're like, oh, but actually my story begins much later than that. That's often the case in, in first time, first drafts, you know, you write your first draft and it's like, you think your story begins way back in Arkansas, but actually begins when they arrived in New York. You know, you don't need the whole Arkansas stuff. You just need the guy arriving in New York. So stories, I think the beginning, so if that's what you mean by how does a writer know the beginning of their story, um, you may think your beginning is there, but it might not be by the time you get to the rewrite, and you'll probably rewrite your beginning more than anything else. Unfortunately, people actually write their beginning more because that's where they start when they open the document. It's like at the beginning, which is a problem. You should actually rewrite your middle and end as much as you rewrite your beginning, but your beginning will change as you write because it's, that's where you're setting up everything. That's where you're setting up, like, you know, that's for me is like, if your story is an arrow flying through the sky, this is the pullback on the bow, you know? And it's as far as you pull back and it's where you aim. And then by the time you get into your second act or you know, even halfway through your first act, you let go. So that's a very important moment, the beginning. And how does a writer know where their beginning is? They, you probably don't until you're getting into the rewriting process and then you change where you begin almost more, than, more often than not. When you rewrite, are you rewriting from the very beginning or are you going back to where you sort of, like how are you breaking up the rewriting? So I probably do go back to the beginning a lot, um, but I try not to. It, it just seems to be the way things happen. So your first 15 pages are fantastic, and then the rest you kind of tend to forget about. Um, the beginning and the end are the most important. So for me, the, 
biggest question someone can ask themselves is, what do I want the audience to feel when they leave the cinema? The moment they leave the cinema, you know, that last frame. When the last frame comes up and it finishes, what do I want the audience to feel at that point? And in the rewrite process, I go back and I look at everything and say, does that serve that feeling, that emotion at the end? If not, I need to change something. It might be in the beginning, it might be in the middle, it might be at the end where you have to change that, that thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but that question is, that's questions in my mind all the time. What do I want the audience to feel when they leave the cinema? And does the scene serve that? If not, do I need it? Can I change it? Can I toss it? So then, yeah, I guess when I rewrite, I rewrite from all over the place, but um, the beginning is so vital that you'll end up rewriting that a lot, yeah. Do you feel like people really neglect rewriting the middle? Yeah. And, and so. so a lot of problems happen because yep. of that? Mm. Definitely. I think, look, you know, the middle of the second act problems, is like, it's like a cliche. Um, I think that, that is a, that's a result of just structure and just that it's, a, it's, it's like a, a tent pole, you know, because you got your beginning, awesome. You know, you know it's going to end fine. Middle, eh, not so sure. So it is, it's a nature of the feature film beast, if you're talking about feature films, that the middle is going to be difficult. Um, but I do think people end up not writing that just because it, from the simplest reasons, you open up your document and it's going to open up on the first page and you're going to rewrite. And then I find like even the craftness of, so if the structure doesn't change much, the dialogue doesn't change much, the craft of the script itself in terms of the words used and the, sp the sp sparsity, sparsity of the words used and the precision of the words used is often better in the beginning and then <laughs> you get halfway and it just becomes messy. So yeah, I would actually encourage people to not do what I do, but to start when you do your rewrite, try and discipline yourself to, I am only rewriting from scene 12 today and then I'm only rewriting from scene 26 because, you know, to make sure that you pay as much attention to that as you can. But yeah, it's a standard error, I guess. I've seen it a lot. When someone presents you with their script mm. and they say, I need you to help me make it better, what are you looking for? What are the main things that are going to stand out to you first, usually? Um, very often when, I, when, I, when I'm in that position with someone who's given me a script and says, you know, do I want to, you know, what can I do to make it better? My question is, why do you want to tell the story? And very often when I do that, I untap, untap, unplug, untap, whatever, a whole well of stuff that's not in the script. Like very often people will say, I want to tell the story because of this and this. And it happened to me when I was younger. And I, There's the story. There's some stuff. Let's put that in the script. So very often I think uh, the first step for me is always, 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 why do you want to tell the story? And if they say, well, to make money and to, you know, be uh, the next um, superhero movie, then I'll say, cool, okay, let's look at structure and let's fix it with the structure and the characters and stuff. As long as I know why you want to tell the story. But then if I dig it a little bit deeper, there might be something else. I say, okay, well, so is the reason you want to tell the story because you feel a little bit insecure and actually need a claim and money to survive in the world? Okay, what happens if your villain has got that same problem in your superhero movie? Ooh, now suddenly it's alive, you know? And then, so, so you can unpack a lot just by asking someone why they want to tell the story. And then you try and apply that to the script and, and then make it a bit better. So that's the first thing I'd say. Um, and then I'm looking for resonance when I'm reading the script. I'm looking for... You know, is this fresh? Is this original? Is this authentic to your, to the story you're trying to tell? And can you make it more authentic by drawing from your memory well or from other, you know, any other sources to make it stronger? Um, and then, you know, you ask all the, the normal questions like, who's your main character? What does he want? Why do I care about him? You know, all those kind of regular screenwriting questions which anyone can ask. But uh, for me, what's more interesting is why do you want to tell a story? And it's funny that people will write a whole feature film script without knowing that. I also didn't know. I mean, I wrote my coming out of suburbia script and only when I did a rewrite with another writer did it come up like, oh, jeepers, my main character's fear is that he doesn't want to leave suburbia because he's scared of the world out there. Because I'm scared of the world. I'm scared of success and you know, all of these things. And that's my character's problem. And then I was like, ah, and then suddenly everything changed. So it's a bit of getting involved in yourself. That can get really strong. And then suddenly the story becomes very clear. And you're like, oh, that's what it is. That's what it's about. So yeah, I would say that's my first. And then, like, you know, is the formatting correct? That's another story. You know, basic formatting errors in scripts is like a, you know, 
that can be a problem. <laughs> but from people who haven't read enough scripts and don't understand, you know, they even they're using Final Draft, but they don't understand. Even if you're using Final Draft, it doesn't mean your formatting is necessarily correct. It can still, you know, you can override certain things. So yeah, so yeah, from the sublime to, uh, you know, why do you want to tell the story to the most mundane, which is is it formatted correctly? <laughs> These are the errors often in first time scripts present. Anything that stayed with you from your time in the UK, something mm. a professor said to you yes. that you applied? Okay. Oh, there's two. There's two statements. So two things that I learned in, in when I was in the UK. The one thing in studying, the one was drama is conflict. And I remember they told me that. And at the time, I was really against conflict, and I'm still against conflict in terms of physical, you know, fighting for some, you know, for something because you want something and somebody else wants something and you fight about it, that, you know, that kind of conflict. Um, and I remember like underlining it angrily and I think I scratched it out angrily. But then I realized afterwards, okay, they're kind of right, it is about conflict, like everything. There needs to be something. So for example, you know, if the story is about you and I and then this glass of water and we both want the water, we have a story. You know, as an actor, you can do that. You can act it. You can perform it. You can find strategies around how to get the water, and then that's your strategy, and that's my strategy. We put them against each other. So, so I think there is conflict, but it might not be physical, actual fighting conflict. There can be strategies that you can apply, and, and so I think that drama is conflict. I've come around to, the, to believe that. So that was the one thing that just kind of stuck with me, because my first reaction to it as a student was like, no, it's not. And then I was like, okay, okay, yeah, no. What's the conflict in the scene? I need to know, what, uh, why am I watching this? And there needs to be something. It can be very simple. It can be that someone's got a piece of, I don't know, sticky paper on his face and you can't get rid of it and stuck. There's a <laughs> conflict between him and the sticky paper, but you know, there's conflict and I'm gonna watch until the, the conflict is resolved. And that's what, I, what is interesting. Um, and human beings tend to run towards gunfire and away from tears. I don't know what that is about us, but we want conflict, we seem to want it, so yeah. Um, and then the other thing that stayed with me was, use the white of the page. Somebody said that, use the white of the page. And what they meant was, I didn't know, it took me a long time to figure this out, but it was that the layout of your script and how you use your action, particularly your action, you know, so if you write, you, um, instead of just writing a block of action, you break it up into sections so that the script looks beautiful, it looks like a script, but it also reads like the movie. So in other words, you use your enter button as like a, like a cut almost. You use long descriptive passages if it's a long lingering shot in your mind. You use short sharp sentences if it's short sharp sentences. Uh, if it's a, you know, a kind of an action scene, you can have like explosions of dialogue here, of, of action here and there. So use the white of the page is great because it starts to talk about the craft of screenwriting and talks about the voice of the writer. So the more scripts you read, the more I, I start to see, oh, this is the voice of the writer. And that's about the white of the page because it's, it's basically like a poem. It's a beautiful, it's a visual document as well. It's not just a, a novel. You, know, you can't say use the white of a page for a novel because novels are just written, they're just text. But if you think of it as with a script, it's even where the dialogue is placed and how much dialogue there is, is it kind of gives you a feeling, it gives you a, um, a tone. Now tonality is actually what movie making is all about. Is you know, what is the tone of this film? What is it, res it comes back to resonance. How do you create the tone of a movie in a script? Well, that's by using the white of the page and by trying to get the voice of your, of your writing and the tone into the script. And that, that's like high maths, high math. You know, that's like advanced, advanced screenwriting is if you can learn to use the white of the page, then you know you're doing something really well.